Available from Polygram Video, NFL's Feel the Power puts you in the middle of the action and unveils the hidden power of the NFL's elite. The NFL's Greatest Games delivers the play-by-play -play power of resilience in two volumes, the Ice Bowl and Super Bowl III. With NFL's Greatest Moments, you'll catch the most powerful images of pro football. Throws his pass, caught by Clark! Shulin has won number 325. Experience the power of laughter with NFL talking Follies. <laughs> okay, throw a fake ball and keep the real ball in your shirt. You can't use more than one ball. Mom! NFL Throwbacks brings you the power of tradition and links future stars with heroes from the past. Lock and load, baby! Lock and load! <laughs> Collect your favorite teams and witness the power of teamwork with the NFL official video yearbooks. Collect them all and feel the power of NFL films on home video. New Edge Pro Gel, official sponsor of NFL Team Highlight Films. Edge Pro Gel will give you a shave so comfortable that no other gel or foam can beat it. For a great, comfortable shave every day, try New Edge Pro Gel. Save your skin. storied history of Chicago sports, no athlete embodied the image of Carl Sandburg Chicago more than Walter Payton. No athlete ran as swift, as savage, or as sweet. climbed higher heights to reach the unreachable. Probably the best running back combination ever in the league would be Walter Payton and any other back. He was the best overall football player I've ever seen. There will be no other durable back to do the kind of things he's done in his incredible life. Quick pitch to Walter, looking for the record, cuts back, he's got it! Walter Payton becomes the National Football League all-time leading rusher to passing Jim Brown. Peyton's long and winding journey to NFL greatness began in the deltas of Mississippi, prospered alongside the skyscrapers of Chicago, and concluded in a hall in the small Ohio town of Canton. Not only is my dad an exceptional athlete, he's a role model. He's my biggest role model and best friend. We made a wager who would be the first one to, uh, to break down in tears. And after hearing my son get up here and talk, I don't care if I lose the bet. I think he just wanted to be the best there ever was. That was his pure motivation. Walter Jerry Payton was born on July 25, 1954 in Columbia, Mississippi to Peter and Aileen Payton. He began playing football in the 11th grade, but even before young Walter strapped on his pads, he already had perfected his moves, playing the simple game of tag. I was always the last one to get caught, and if you got caught, you was it, and you had to catch everybody else. And I knew how hard it was, so I never did want to get caught. So I would just be running and fading and sliding under and jumping over and just trying to get away. In 1971, he enrolled at Jackson State University. And from the very beginning, he dominated, thanks in large part to his most influential football mentor. 
We had a coach there by the name of uh, Robert Hill who uh, he had a different philosophy in terms of uh, coaching. Hill placed little importance on non-contact drills, believing that the best way to nurture a successful football team was to have them play a lot of football. Monday, we scrimmage. Tuesday, we scrimmage. Wednesday, we scrimmage. Thursday, we scrimmage. As a four-year starter, Peyton averaged over six yards a carry, rushed for over 3,500 yards, and attracted other top prospects to the program. Everyone was talking about this hot, new, sensational running back that, that they had, and sure enough, he was a pretty special. I remember thinking, man, wouldn't it be nice to go there and be on the team with him? And I got to meet him and saw what a neat guy he was, and I said, man, I'd sure like to play with him, and, and ended up you know, getting a chance to block for him. Walter finished his college career as the leading scorer in NCAA history, piling up an astounding 66 touchdowns in only 43 games. From 1971 to 74, Peyton and the Tigers won 33 games while losing just nine. During that same four-year span, the Chicago Bears lost 38 games. The monsters of the Midway had not had a winning season in 10 years, and they looked to a young back from the South to provide salvation. Our team finished the 1974 season on a very bad note. We made the decision at that time that we must change. We must get a more positive attitude created in the Bear organization. I'd gotten a call and it was uh, Jim Finks. And he said, uh, he asked me, you know, how would I like to uh, play for the Bears? I said, it doesn't matter who I play for. I'm gonna play as hard as I can. Chicago Bears, first round selection. Walter Payton, P-A-Y-T-O-N. Running back, Jackson State. One man alone can't turn an offense around, but in Walter Payton, the Bears have a player who can give it a tremendous boost. The scouts knew about Walter, but the public didn't know. Everyone said, who's Walter Payton? Well, he wanted to show people who Walter Payton was. The fourth overall pick hoped to make his Bear debut a special one. Instead, he gained zero yards on eight carries and instantly felt the wrath of a town that was tired of football failure. It's devastating because they were, they were dogging me out. Everybody said, oh, he, he's going to be a bust. He can't even do this. He can't do that. After the game, when it came time, I was walking out of the stadium. My wife was with me, and he was walking along right next to us, and he had tears running down his cheeks. Uh, I think just out of instinct, she reached out and put her hand on his arm, and she said, don't worry, it's going to be better. <laughs> she had pretty good insight. Peyton's transition to the pro game was a bit smoother during the rest of his rookie season. the Bears' leading rusher and the league's top kickoff returner. If you looked at it from, from a football standpoint, it was a lot easier than I expected. But if you look at it from a cultural aspect, it was definitely a shock. Having been raised in the South, Walter found it difficult adapting his rural roots to the big city lifestyle and the frigid weather of Chicago. Playing for a team that won only four games in his first year posed even more of a challenge. It was, uh, it was very, very difficult because you know, when you're so used to, uh, to coming from behind or, you know, overcoming odds and when you get up to the professional levels and, you know, it doesn't happen that way, it's, uh, it's kind of scary. Despite the Bears' lack of success, Peyton refused to even consider how things might have been better had he been drafted by another team. 
I felt at that time, it might not be the philosophy of, for people today, but I felt that was a coward's way. If you couldn't make it with the team that you were drafted with then and you had to go somewhere else, that was, uh, to me, was a sign of failure. He recognized the Bears' lack of overall talent and was determined to fill that void. The multi-talented Peyton realized early in his career that the Bears needed him to be more than just the best runner in the NFL. By playing here, I developed all my skills and I was able to do a lot of things. Whereas if I went to Pittsburgh because they had Stallworth and these other guys, Lance Juan, they wouldn't need me to catch passes. In an era of specialization, he became a true football renaissance man. I'm telling you that he was the best overall because he ran, he blocked, he tackled, he did, he passed, he kicked, you know, he did everything you asked him to do and he'd do it. He would block, he'd block as hard as anybody I've ever seen or he'd catch the ball and run with it, uh, receiving, he could do it all. Rolling out left, being chased by Browner, steps and heat the left side of the end zone for Peyton over the center. With wide receiver like skills, Walter remains the Bears' all time leader in receptions. Despite his ability to excel as a receiver, his one true love was always passing. I remember Gary Fensick saying once that. In all the years he was with the Bears, the Bears never had a quarterback who threw the ball more in practice than Walter did. And I love the, uh, the passing plays that I got a chance to throw. Dennison motion back toward the line, quick pitch to Walter, fakes the end around. Walter's going to throw! Man wide open! Touchdown, Dunsmore! In his career, the Bears quasi-quarterback threw eight touchdown passes. His finest aerial display took place in a game against the Saints. In addition to this 60-yard heave, he passed for another touchdown, ran for a score, and rushed for 161 yards. In 1984, when injuries devastated their quarterback core, the Bears used the versatile Peyton in some innovative offensive plays. While passing was his greatest love, his blocking may have been his greatest skill. And I think that's the greatest compliment you can give the guy who gained the most yardage in the NFL in history. That's the greatest compliment. He was probably as good a blocker as I've ever seen. No game demonstrated Walter's blocking prowess better than a key come from behind win in 85. With the Bears trailing late in the game, Jim McMahon was put in to save the day. He's chewing the gum with the uh, one eye half closed, and he calls pass and play, and so let's go. He walks up to the line, he's checking the line out. I'm checking the, uh, the defensive line out too because I see a guy kind of cheats up in there, and then I say, oh God, he's coming. But my number one priority is, is outside. And I thought Walter, checked the inside, then he came back out. But the guy on the inside was the most dangerous. Just as he had a run his start, he was reaching for McMahon, I kind of took him out of the picture. As I come away from the center, I stumbled a bit, and uh, that's when Walter came in and blocked the, the blitzing linebacker. Vikings coming out of blitz, McMahon back to throw. That play would have never happened. If, if Walter would have came off and made that block, I mean, McMahon would have got murdered. Quite simply, Peyton was the quintessential all-around football player, the prototype for all others to emulate, a goal which continues to be difficult, judging from the fact that his diverse skills allowed him to accumulate over 21,000 combined yards, 5,000 yards more than his closest competitor. Throughout 
Hallis's life, Bears founder George Hallis had an enormous impact on the people of Chicago. Early in Walter's pro career, the experience of being around Papa Bear left Peyton in awe. When you first meet him, the feeling that you have is sort of like, uh, I'm not worthy. Whenever he came around, you, uh, you, got, uh, you got your act in order because you, you, know, you never knew what to say. You never knew how to approach him because you felt like, uh, oh my God, this is the man. And it, it, was a, it was a humbling experience when you walked into his presence. Even today, images of Hallis remain etched in Peyton's memory. We were having a little trouble holding on to the ball, so he came in and I think he, he asked for a football, so I, I don't know if it was me or somebody that ran up to get it and came back and he said, this is where you hold it. Let's see, let's see where you carry that ball. Yeah. That's right. As long as you get in that, they can't knock that thing. That's the most important thing right there. We had a fullback by the name of Decady, and he just set a record of 13 fumbles. I showed him this the next season. He didn't have one. As a tribute to the Bears founder, Walter began the George S. Hallis Walter Payton Foundation, an organization designed to offer kids guidance and support in a friendly and safe environment. Our foundation is to make a difference, wherever that need or wherever that uh, positioning may be, and that's what we do. Walter's dedication to helping kids is evident, even when it comes to the simplest of tasks. I'd like to get into a situation when you sign autographs that you interact with that person somehow, or you ask him questions about where he's from, what he's doing. I have two kids and I would if they had an opportunity to meet, you know, one of their heroes, I would appreciate it if they you know, give the uh, courtesy to be just a little personal. Formed as a way to honor the man who meant so much to Walter, the foundation keeps the Hallis name and spirit alive. In just his third year as a pro, at the age of 23, Peyton became the youngest player ever to win the league's MVP. Despite his relative lack of experience, he had already established himself as a rare running back. I was probably a running that that wouldn't die easy. It's like one of those cowboy movies where a guy is, is, is coming at him and, and he gets shot once and he down and gets shot again and he gets again and again and he's still walking. Then all of a sudden, big explosion go boom, arm over here, arm over there, leg over there, and they still trying to get together. That's the type of run I was. His cowboy-like style can be traced back to his early football roots. My uh, college coach taught me that never uh, Never go easy. He had a, a defensive mindset in terms of being a running back and trying to deliver a blow. If somebody was going to hit him, he'd rather hit them first. Peyton was relentless, and he ran with a fury. Uh, it was like he was mad all the time. He wanted to punish people. He wanted to just get at them and attack them. It seemed even when there was wide open field calling him, Walter opted instead to initiate contact. He wouldn't take way out by running through the sidelines. He'd come everywhere. You and him, he would come straight at me. I'm telling you, people just didn't even attack on him. He punished him. He's a guy that you didn't want to play against uh, week after week after week because you knew he was going to get you. Every time he had the ball, it was an explosion on his part. One time I pulled up around the corner, Walter was behind me, and he said, don't hit the first guy, hit the second guy. I hit the second guy and sprung him for a long run. So back in the 
film session, we got a chance to take a look at it. And so my coach said, my officer line coach said, how come you didn't hit the first guy? Walter whispered to him, don't hit him. I got him. He had great, great strength. And he had that flipper, as he called it, the forearm. His forearm was like Popeye's forearm. And if you watched the film, he would use that thing like a club. All the times we played him, I went into the game with one goal. Do not get straight armed by Walter Payton. But no matter how hard opponents tried, the straight arm could not be avoided. If a guy is, is coming to tackle you, his head has to be down like this and he, when, he, when he extends his arms. And if, he, if his head goes down as he extends his arms, that means he has a longer reach. If you get his head back, his arms are back. So he might not get a chance to grab you. Physical punishment was only part of Peyton's arsenal against defenseless defenders. It's kind of a little signature he had when he'd break out of a pack and get some open ground. He'd make a little jump, actually, and, and a kind of a stride in midair. And to me, it reminded me of a little show pony galloping around the ring. But the show pony kick was not just for show. I was quick, but not fast. That's why I developed that, uh, that stutter step or whatever it is, because, you know, I could break away from it. 30 yards or 40 yards, but if I had to go 60, 70 yards, I'd probably get caught. The same footwork that once allowed him to rule the game of tag now left would-be tacklers embarrassed. They didn't know what you were going to do. They didn't know if you were going to go straight. They didn't know if you were going to come at them. They didn't know if you were going to stop. If you run down the sideline, this guy here who's a defensive guy, he's already calculated in his mind where he's gonna hit you at. He knows where you're gonna be at at a certain time because he's judging your speed. So that's when I start my, my stutter step or whatever because what that does, it makes him change his speed. So you do that, so he has to think and then it gives you that edge and you, and he, you right by him. You knew he was gonna make that one play, that one big gigantic leap and just waited for it during the game. Peyton conquered gravity with the greatest of ease. We were playing the Detroit Lions, and he jumped over me, and I was standing straight up. And he jumped right over us, and that's incredible. And on those rare occasions when his leaping ability failed him, his determination allowed him to accomplish his goal. Everybody looks at this physical quality or that physical quality and forget about the heart. And the heart's what makes the great ones. Walter Payton, he's too short, too short my butt. I mean, he got the heart. Too short, too slow, too small. And yet in the history of pro football, no other back had the ability to create something out of nothing like Payton. Even when everyone else assumed a play was over, Walter was still going fighting, clawing, doing whatever it took to excel. He's got great ability, great moves, great strength, and all that kind of stuff, his determination. His, his ability to carry the ball, you know, that many times a game, even when he's hurt, is his greatest asset. For 13 seasons, Walter played the most grueling position in sports. all kinds of weeks when at midweek he couldn't practice he could hardly walk he didn't want medication he didn't want to get shots he, he refused to get shots come Sunday he played I played games where I couldn't raise my right hand above my head I didn't have enough strength in it to raise it up 
If the measure of true greatness is the ability to endure, then there is no one greater than Peyton. A lot of times he got hurt, and people never realized how often he got fucked up and bruised, but he kept on playing. Probably the best demonstration of his durability occurred on a cold November day in 1977. Despite being far less than 100%, Walter ran over the Viking defense for 275 yards. His record day remains the highest rushing game total ever. He had the flu so bad he was throwing up and had a fever, and he ran for 275 yards. In his career, Peyton played in 190 out of 191 games. The one game he did not play in took place during his rookie year against the Steelers. You thought that black smoke was going to come from his nose or something like that. He was so upset. Indeed, even today he remains upset at the assumption that he sat out because he was injured. It was not because I couldn't play. It still goes down as a game that you didn't play in. But uh, I was there, I was dressed out. It wasn't, wasn't the reason that I couldn't play. The coach decided to use uh, Mike Adamway, and Mike had a terrific game that game, so he didn't put me in. But I was ready to play, so everybody thinks, well, he only missed one game. I like to put clear the record up and says he only missed one game because the coach decided not to put him in. I often wondered about his stamina, how he could just keep, keep going on and on and on like that. And then he once told me about his workout routine, his training routine, running running those hills down in Mississippi on those deltas and burning out guys who come out to run with them, you know, track guys, burning them all out and torturing himself. He began running up sandbanks and levees at Jackson State when the stadium steps were inadequate for his training needs. His unique routine continued when he found the hill near his home in Illinois. There was no shades, no trees out there, nothing. Nothing but dust and, uh, and, and some dirt. Once you get halfway, you're thinking, I can stop. But the angle is so steep that if you stop, it's even harder to get started back. When you go down, you're not in control. The, the hill controls you. He had a regiment that was, that, that defied what the U.S. Marines would do. I brought Otis Wilson up there, I brought, uh, took Hanford Dixon there. They're throwing up, because it, it's, it's a mother. As solid physically as anybody I've ever seen, he was just uh, a rock. I kind of like uh, liking him to, to, to James Brown, the hardest working man in showbiz. <laughs> Boy, uh, Walter Payton was one of the hardest working football players uh, to play out there. For many, the image of Walter and his hill will last forever. And perhaps it is fitting that no one else can ever claim to be king of that hill. It turned into a part three golf course. It's not there anymore. During Peyton's first seven years, the Bears had only two winning seasons. In 1979, during a rare playoff appearance against the Eagles, the Bad News Bears reached an all-time low. Hey, break free! He might score! He's in the 50! Down the first sideline, touch the end of the break through! Touch the end of the break through! And he goes all the way inside the 20 to 15 and tears the five He dances into the end zone! What should have been a key touchdown and Walter's longest run of his career was instead called back. In 1982, owner George Hallis was tired of his team's losing ways and in an attempt to turn it around, he hired former Bear Mike Ditka as his head coach. When uh, Mike came in, he said that, uh, you know, we're going to win the Super Bowl. Everybody looked around and he just said, oh yeah, you're right. He said, you can come along for the ride or you could get off. Either way, we're still going. During Ditka's first year, the team filled another piece of the puzzle when they drafted quarterback Jim McMahon. Come on, now, All you got to do is want it as much as we know we want it. You want it that much? Yeah, 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 let's go. The Bears began to show signs of improvement. They won five of their last six games in 83. And for the first time, Walter could see a light at the end of the tunnel.
In addition to having a competitive team, the Bears now also had other individuals who, like Walter, combined a tireless dedication on the field with an offbeat attitude away from it. Joker. He was one of the biggest jokers. He was a practical joker, as, as good as anybody. It didn't matter where or when, at any time or place, the Joker was always lurking, ready to strike. He came in on a terrible cold day from practice. Somehow he was able to get in early. He locked the locker room and went in the shower, and the coaches and the players were all outside freezing. He's called my wife up a number of times. You know, just two weeks ago, he called her up. I'd call their house, and I'll uh, pretend like I was a female, looking for him, you know, crying and everything else. You know, about, oh, God, he he told me he wasn't married and this and that. And he sounds like a girl, so you know, he gets his voice up that high, and uh, he had my wife calling. Whether he was racing his cars, performing on stage, or showing off his singing voice. Walter never took himself too seriously. The greatest love of all. You like that, huh? Yes, it's me, Michael Jackson. <laughs> At the start of the 1984 season, what many people thought would never happen was about to become a reality. Walter was going to surpass Jim Brown's record of 12,312 yards. This has got to be one of the greatest days, not only for him, but for the fans who sat out through 10 years or whatever of it. Oh, just rain so and snow. snow and sleet and hail. <laughs> but it's been, Walter has been the man who's made it for us these past years. This is my first football game ever in life that I've seen outside of television. And it's the history of it that really brought me down here. I've got my camera, i got everything ready. When he breaks this record, I'm going to be right here, and I'm going to say, yeah, Walter, I need to do it. attacked the Saints defense with the same fury he had run with for his previous 12,000 yards. Also, the athletes that uh, that didn't get an opportunity to, like the Overstreets and the Delaney's and the Brian Piccolo's, you know, this simplifies what the game is made of. And what I did out there today is a reflection of those guys, because they made the sacrifices as well. And it's a tribute to me to bestow this honor upon them. 
During his greatest individual achievement, Walter stood his tallest. Today, his 16,726 yards stand as a goal for others to strive for, as Walter had tirelessly strived to reach Brown's milestone. You know, he passed his record, but you know what? You have to look in perspective. If he would have just played another three, three years, another four years, you know, he probably had 20,000 yards. Using his record day as a springboard, the Bears roared through the rest of the 84 season. The team won 10 games, as Ditka called Walter's number more times in this campaign than in any other season. If we continue defensively and offensively to play like we're playing, you know, and control our central division, we're going to win this thing. I think the 84 team was more special than the 85 team because that's where the character was developed. Their character was put to the ultimate test in a playoff game against the defending NFC champion Redskins. When we uh, went to Washington, nobody gave us a chance of winning that game because we were playing on the road. The Bears hadn't won a playoff game since 63, and we went in there and <sighs> beat their butts. Play as hard as you can on every play. Anybody can affect the outcome of this game. Let's make sure we do our best at all times. Be smart and let's go after them. Come on. Walter led the charge against the Skins, rushing for over 100 yards. perfect pass enabled the Bears to taste playoff success for the first time in over 20 years. Got the tempo for the World Championship, guys! Let's go! Let's go! Wait, you're not there right now! Let's go! The win over Washington put the Bears into the NFC Championship game against the powerful 49ers. This long run by Walter was the first and last bright moment for Chicago. Montana rolling out the right side, looking toward the end zone, now throwing, fires, it's caught by Solomon, touchdown, 49ers! San Francisco overpowered the overmatched Bears, but even with the game already decided, Walter refused to go quietly. On the last play of the game, after the gun had already been sounded, Peyton was still fighting. greatest feeling that I ever had in football and the worst feeling I ever had in football. It was a week apart and uh, I, uh, after the loss against San Francisco, I thought, you know, it took almost 10 years to get here. I won't, you know, nine years, there'll be another nine years before we get back here and I won't be around. So, I, you know, those are things that go through your head and Wilbur Marshall in particular said, be holding your head down. You know, he was upset and he was bitter. He said, next year we come in, we, we're not just going to knock on the door, we're going to kick the damn door down. Well, here's another third down try for the Bears. Third and six from the 16 of Indianapolis. McMahon takes the snap, hands it off to Peyton. Big hole up the middle, to the 10, to the 5, to the end zone. Touchdown! Following Wilbur Marshall's plan, Walter and the Bears dominated the 85 season, rolling over opponents who a year before had stood in their way. lost only one game, captured the imagination of the entire city of Chicago, 
and earned a return trip to the playoffs against the New York Giants. I knew that this was a good team we were playing, and it was just a matter of time. If they get on the roll, it would be hard for us to beat them. The Giants never got on that roll, thanks to some divine intervention. And when that happened, I had no doubts that we were going to win the game. It was sort of like when he got ready to punt, George Hallis just took his hands from heaven and said, not today. Oh, he missed this! He missed this! All right. The following week, Chicago's march to the title continued against the Rams. Soldier Field in Chicago, the NFC Championship, and a trip to New Orleans for Super Bowl XX. I always remember being on the field before a playoff game in 85 and hearing him in the middle of the huddle. And he sounded like a wild man. Kick ass, let everything hang out. Am I right? Am I right? Am I right? Several key runs by Walter, and once again some help from above, confirmed that this was indeed a team of destiny. The, the snow started to fall, the crowd started to cheer. When that happened, it was sort of like nobody else existed on the football field except the Bears. And I think that was the ultimate for me. That, uh, that feeling that we're going to the Super Bowl was uh, the best feeling that I've uh, experienced in football. After 10 seasons, the greatest running back of all time had finally reached the biggest game of all time. Okay? Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. 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 New England would accomplish little in this lopsided affair. Although they did succeed in one aspect of their game plan. New England's focus was Walter Payton. They said, we're going to stop Walter Payton. I mean, everywhere he went, there was two or three guys there with him. Uh, the one play I remember, the first play of the second half, where we were backed up in the end zone, I faked the ball to Walter, and you can see the whole defensive football team go after him. And I think that's, that's really what hurt the New England Patriots in that game. That was their downfall, worrying so much about Walter, they, they let everybody else uh, have a pretty good day. Looking back now, it seems almost appropriate. The greatest player ever, playing the ultimate team role of decoy in his team's finest hour. But at the time, Walter wanted to take a more starring role in his team's domination. And that was probably the most disturbing thing in my career at Bob Hanks when you know, people said, wow, you didn't give the ball to Walter to score in the Super Bowl. If I had one thing to do over again, I would make sure that he took the ball in the end zone. You know, he'd played for so long and, and been, uh, he'd, he'd been the Chicago Bears for so many years. And to see him not be able to get in that end zone. It, it had to hurt. I mean, it hurt me not seeing him score a touchdown. During his entire career, Walter felt that his individual accomplishments meant little when his team lost. Now he realized the same was true when his team won. It was a disappointing feeling at that moment. And then it was like, hey, after I realized, you know, exactly what, uh, what it didn't mean, then it was okay. Finally being part of a winner and seeing how the city of Chicago reacted to that championship helped Walter get over any emptiness he may have felt. Ten years later, the Super Bowl trophy stands as the ultimate compliment to his perfect career. This was for you because you stood by us, you gave us the support, we had fun doing it, and thanks to you, we all can celebrate. In 1975, a young man from the South took his skills to the Windy City.
In a short period of time, Chicago fell in love with and embraced its new favorite son. In fact, his motto became their motto. By the end of his career, he was as comfortable skating across the frozen turf as he was running along the sandbanks in Mississippi. In 1987, Walter Payton retired from pro football. He went out on top, gaining over 100 yards in his final contest. At the very end, it was difficult to walk away from the game that had given him so much. I was just recapping some of the uh, great moments that was there. And I didn't want to rush through it because if you stay there long enough and these things would be etched in your mind and in your heart and soul. I always remember once I was talking with Bud Grant and we were talking about Chuck Foreman. And I said, didn't he have an awful short career? Grant said he played five or six years. He said, that's about average for a running back. He said, you people in Chicago are spoiled. He said, this guy you have down there is a phenomenon. He was never, never gave an inch, always gave everything he had. And you knew that if you were a fan, an announcer, a player, a coach. I mean, he just was everything that you'd ever want in a football player. For 13 seasons, Walter Payton inspired wonder in all those who had the privilege to watch him play. His runs made fans marvel, and his unselfishness made 30-year-old, 300-pound linemen act like children. Myself or Noah Jackson, we'd run in the end zone, try to get the ball so you could spike it. That was kind of a good feeling, too. It made us feel as if we scored the touchdown. And maybe that is Walter's greatest gift. Not his athletic talent, but his unique ability to touch all those who came in contact with him. He was just a great, great person to play with. I'm just glad I was able to, to play with a guy like that. I loved playing against him. I loved watching him. There should be more Walter Payton's. His records and statistics are astounding, and yet to measure him by numbers alone would be short-sighted. I had the benefit of playing with him and against him. A real competitor, good person, uh, and tough. A true leader, a true role model, and a true person. In all the years of pro football, there has never been another player like him. So proud to be alive, coarse, strong, cunning, and pure. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, keep swinging. Nah, keep bombing your head. Through all your trials and your problems, keep bombing your head. Keep swinging. <laughs> Check it out. Uh. The things you're hoping for And the evidence of what you can't see Don't let the trials that you're facing Get you stressed and can't be flexing Keep believing every day That it's already made a way It's working Oh, yeah Keep believing It's 
working. You gotta keep swinging, swinging. You gotta keep pressing now. Race is not one till the end. But we got on your side. You can put the devil behind. Keep believing every day. Just a love of make a way. Just work it out. Showman, he was all that you always wanted to be in a running back. I remember a lot of Walter Payton runs, you know, just from watching the one run where he's about to go down and look like he's about to jam his neck up and the guy hits him and he just comes straight up and spins off that guy and he's fighting and fighting and fighting. One of the things that I do want to do like Walter, but I never got a chance to, was Every time he went to the end zone, he would always like high step, you know. And, you know, I can never do that. <laughs> there have been many great backs come through the league, but there's only one that stands right now above the rest. And that's sure because of his, his records and what he's been able to accomplish in this league. And that has to be Walter Payton. I had an ability, a gift from God, and I wanted to exploit it. I had to prove something to myself. I wanted to be the best that I possibly can. When you see an open field, the first thing you see is, oh my God, I hope I don't get caught. How hard do you think it's going to be to say goodbye? I think it'd uh, probably be the hardest thing I have ever had to do. Good evening, everybody. I'm Roy Firestone, and this is an up close special. He wasn't big by football standards, 5'10, 202 pounds. But Walter Payton, who in 13 years missed only one game, was one of the roughest, toughest competitors who ever lived. No man ever carried the ball more often and for more yardage than sweetness, but that's just dry stats. He embodied the essence of football fight for every yard, fight every day, take nothing for granted. On this program, we'll hear in his own words, why we should never take him for granted. Once you, you, you make it up in your mind and in your heart that, uh, that you're gonna, you want to accomplish something or you want to do something in life, and you dedicate yourself to that, and 
and you won't let yourself accept anything but that, then that's where the drive comes from. That's where the uh, determination and all the hard work, because I felt that uh, I had an ability or gift from God, and I wanted to exploit it, not for myself, but uh, just to do it because I had it. It was something that was given to me, and it was given to me for a reason. And uh, I just wanted to utilize it the best of my ability. What I admired about Walter was his competitive spirit. If, every time I saw him play, whether it was the first play, or if it was the first run, or if it was the 30th mm -hmm. run, it was always the same speed, the mm -hmm. same effort, the same determination. I mean, it was a guy that was, he was just determined to be the best. You know, I came from a, as people say, small school that uh, people will kind of scratch their heads about and say, well, they play pretty good football, but if they get into the professional ranks, they might not be able to hold what they're doing. So I had something to prove there. Whenever, when I came in, I already, I already had something to prove because people, you know, they had doubts in their mind. Then we showed that we could play with anybody. And uh, after that, I had to prove something to myself. I wanted to be the best that I possibly can, not the best that, that uh, a former Jim Brown was or a former Gail Sears or guys before me. I don't want to reach their level. I want to reach what my level is. If it's below that or beyond that, that's what I'm shooting for. First of all, before, 80% of the game this year, I watched Walter Payton film, and one thing I noticed about him is, is no matter what, he kept his feet moving. He kept his feet moving, and it would never stop, and I tried to incorporate that into my game, and it, it really helped me a, a whole lot. And uh, he was just an overachiever. He was a small guy. Like I said, he wasn't the fastest guy, but he made you, he made you work to tackle him. You know, it's, uh, it's funny. I don't think it's, it's running. It's a feeling that you get when you're out there and you're making cuts or you're making uh, moves or you're catching passes or you're just out there. It's sort of like performing, like a ballet or something. The thing I love most about football, and uh, it, might seems, it might seem that it's contradicting itself simply because my job is to evade people and to get the ball down the field, but I enjoy the contact. When somebody's coming up to hit you, if you, in terms, take the lick, the next time he comes in, he's going to say, well, I'm going to hit him a little bit harder, or I'm going to really draw back and get a shot at him. So what you do is you change that by, instead of being hit, you just meet the, the blow. You know, the law of physics tells you that an object standing still, another object coming, the one that's standing still is going to take the brunt of the blow. Right. But if you guys meet, it's the one who goes the fastest or the one who's uh, better conditioned It's going to... Uh, going to inflict the most pain. You know, I call Walter a uh, second and third effort football player, running back. You know, because, you know, you hit him, if you don't wrap him up, well, he's going to break it. Mm -hmm. And uh, he just had that desire to, to keep going all the time. And uh, as, as Ricky said, it wasn't the fastest, uh, wasn't the quickest, but, you know, if you didn't hit him, uh, he, he, could, he could go. When you see an open field, the first thing you see is, oh, my God, I hope I don't get caught. <laughs> That's the first thing that comes in your mind. When you do that little stutter step, mm -hmm. is there a kind of posture in that? I mean, it, I, I never noticed it until maybe the last three, four years. Mm -hmm. There's almost kind of a, it's almost kind of an attitude as much as it's a, it's a step. I don't know if you agree with that. Uh, I don't think it's an attitude. I think it's a means of survival. In other words, uh, as evolution goes, you learn to, to adapt certain things to make you survive. And I think that's one of the things I've uh, acquired simply because when I use that step, See that step? what it does for me, it breaks my timing, it breaks my rhythm down so that the opposing guy that's coming, he can't, in other words, when I'm running, he said, well, right, I'm going to zero him in on uh, ground two. So I'm coming and when I get to ground two, he's got his full head of steam going. But when I take that step, then he has to go, oh my God, I got to recalculate. And see, it gives me that edge because football is a game of angles and uh, seconds. And if you can change the angles, then you got the edge. When we played them my, my rookie year, and, uh, you know, hearing about Walter Payton, and, you know, I was, you know, and you were a rookie, you kind of got your own little arrogant thing going. So, I mean, I stood on the sidelines to watch him play. I stood up. I said, I'm going to stand and watch him, but I want to see him really run the football. And I saw him knock out one of our defensive backs. They brought him to the sidelines, <laughs> and he didn't know his name. I just thought that was the funniest thing <laughs> that I had ever seen because they were the same size. My aggression, uh, instead of going outward and striking at, back at somebody else. I don't do that. What I use, I use that to kindle a burning desire inside of me that I already have to fuel it. And it just uh, gives me that, uh, that sense that I block out everything. My teammates and the people around me, where I'm playing, the weather, pain, and it's 
it's you and me. Last February, when Walter announced his illness, friends and colleagues found it difficult to comprehend that a man that tough, a man who'd overcome so much, might actually succumb to a rare disease. When I first heard of it, I was shocked because here I am, I'm like, well, psst, I got this hip thing going and he has something that makes my hip look like, oh, I just broke a nail. It's just hard to imagine talking about the Chicago Bears and not speaking of them and Walter in the same sentence. When we return, sweetness was his nickname, but his road to glory was often bittersweet, as our Walter Payton retrospective continues. Welcome back to our Walter Payton special. I'm Roy Firestone. Walter went to a small school, Jackson State, and he went most of his career playing for inferior teams. In the first nine seasons of pro ball, his Bear teams went nine games under 500. And so opposing teams looked to do only one thing when they played Chicago, stop Payton. They couldn't, not for long anyway. He ran the way he felt, every inch he was out to prove something. You almost killed yourself getting there. You and your brother Eddie <laughs> running along the banks of the Pearl yeah. River that white sand, doing it to such a point that anyone who tried to work out with you collapsed in pain and agony, running steps, running hills, putting yourself in the kind of physical condition that was almost superhuman. I mean, you take a look at this guy's thighs, <laughs> or if you take a look at his arms, even a year and a half removed from the game, you're a man that was a physical specimen that truly unmatched. It was a pride thing, but it was a drive. I want to know if, if anywhere there was a fear, not necessarily the fear of failure, but the fear of not making the best of what you had. I mean, you always realize that deep back in your mind that and you have something and it's a possibility that it could go on to higher places. And then once you start on that journey, you know, there's, there's always the fear of failure. There's always the fear of, of something happening to offset what you're, uh, you're shooting for. And with me, I don't think it was, uh, was any difference. I had those feelings also because once you reach a certain level and you, you achieve certain things and you want to go beyond that, it's always frightening, you know, opening another door going into a different dimension. There is that driving force, and there always has been, as we said, and we've been saying throughout the show, about being the best. I remember the year you lost the rushing title mm -hmm. to OJ, and you, you broke down and you wept. Yeah. You don't see that among professional athletes. Oh, well, I did my best, and, uh, but you really, you were like a your heart was out on the sleeve. Well, that's that's the way, that's how competitive I am, and you know it was an opportunity. And it, I guess at that particular time, it was just not in the cards for me because I ended up uh, twisting my ankle. And I guess everything happens for a reason. And the next year, I came out a little bit more determined and a little bit more aggressive, and uh, things happened the way they were supposed to. But like I said, maybe if I'd have won the Russian title that year, it maybe it would, would have changed me to a point where I wouldn't be the person I am now. Mm. But like I said, I'm happy that things worked out the way they did. There's always been a debate about the nickname, Sweetness. Did it come because of his sweet running style or his sweet personality? And where did it come? Did it come in college or high school or before that? It came right before my uh, professional career when we were playing in the uh, postseason college bowl games. And a couple of guys, uh, Revi Sori, who was going with the Bears, and uh, Bob Evelini. And, well, at that particular time, you know, it was like, as uh, the times go, there are certain sayings like, all right, and at that particular time, this, the uh, saying was, oh, how sweet it is. Oh, that's how sweet. sweet it is. So some of the moves that I would make in practice and kidding around people would say, that was, that was a sweet move. And after we got through practicing, we'd go in the, to the hotels and like, see me walking around in the lobby. And for lack of anything else to call, they think about the move, hey, hey sweet, sweetness. And then, uh, there is a couple of theories about why Walter Payton doesn't return back to Columbia, Mississippi, or very often get back home. One is your dad. Your dad died tragically in jail after being picked up on a drunk driving charge. You think he, I, I think he had a stroke or a, a brain hemorrhage. Brain hemorrhage that you always quietly resented, stated or unstated, the racism there, that you felt that it cost your father his life. True? No, I think the reason that it happened, well, it cost him his life, was because it was a small town and people were not aware as to uh, certain things. Like when you have a brain hemorrhage, what it does, the first thing that goes is your motor skills, and it makes you appear to be as if that you're intoxicated. But if, they, if someone at that particular time would have known that and been uh, more 
advanced as far as uh, their technology and procedures, they probably would have knew that. But because of that, that was it. It wasn't a case of, uh, of racism or whatever thing. It was just a small time atmosphere with the uh, people who just really didn't know. Why don't you get back then? Well, my mom moved away from Columbia. She lives in Jackson. And uh, she's the light of my life. And uh, so that's where it, uh, it ends now. Up next, the field of dreams off the field. Walter Payton's other success stories as our Walter Payton retrospective continues. Welcome back. You look back at the ledger of his life and you're sure of one thing. Walter Payton would have been a success in anything he did. And he did many things away from football. He was an entrepreneur. He owned a race car, restaurants, dozens of enterprises. I talked to him about his view of success. Yeah, football, life, and business, they're so closely related. It's unbelievable. I can remember we were, were in the same situations when I was playing with the Bears. We had just lost to the Houston Oilers uh, 40 to nothing. We had to win the last seven games to even think about getting into the playoffs. And believe it or not, we did. We won all seven games we wow. got into the playoffs. And that's a lesson because even though you're down, don't give up because once you submit, then anything can happen to you. But if you keep on fighting and, and you know, keep your focus, you can always win. And that's the key thing. Do ne don't ever give up. There's a story that when you were in first grade, you were in line, a little kid, <laughs> and you couldn't stand the idea. You had to wait in line. Yeah. Come, come on, let's go already. Let's go. And finally, you started to run ahead of the line. And the big boys were chasing you to try to calm you down. And you, uh, you gave them the little stutter step. Yeah. And that's where the stutter step was born, right? Is that true? Well, it didn't come into prominence until the NFL. Yeah, but that but, was the uh, beginning, huh? I'm standing in line. You know, as, as a kid in first grade, you know, certain things, they don't compute. You know, you, you have to go to school. At a certain time, you got to be there, and you got to do everything they ask you to do. And then once it comes quitting time, it's like, hey, it's quitting time. I'm ready to go home. But you have to walk in line until you get off, kick off the uh, school grounds, and then you go. And I didn't see the, uh, the sense in, you know, why did I have to stay in line? I'm like, hey, school is out. So I'm in line, so I get out of line, and she tells me to get back in line. And I said, no, and then I started running, and the other kids were trying to trip me, and then guys were trying to get me and stop me. It didn't work. I got home, but they caught me the next day because I had to go back to school. <laughs> See, here's, here's what I'm trying to say about Walter. He's so competitive. There's so much drive, and it's always been there. You enter the Soul Train dancing contest. This is a few years back, and you did a great job, and everyone was going, wow, Walter can really dance. And you were angry at yourself because you felt you should have won it instead of taking second place. <laughs> and you would later say, if I would have had a better dance partner, we would have won it, oh, right? Well, I Come on she now. Pro she probably saying the same thing, too. <laughs> if she'd had a better dance partner, she'd have won. You could have been anything you wanted, really, truly. Well, you know, that's, that's true in anybody. It, uh, it's just a matter of uh, your, the frame of mind that you're in. And if you can visualize what you want to do, you can do it. And... Um, I just so happened that uh, football was something that uh, was close to me that I grew up with, and uh, I decided that I was going to do that. I felt if, uh, if it had been basketball, if the town that I grew up in would have been more of a basketball town, then I'd probably been a basketball player. Same goes for ownership, too, in the NFL? Yes. You think that you'll, you probably will be the first black owner? I hope so. Or and part I, owner? I can see myself as that, and uh, like I said, if you can visualize it, then it can, it's possible. I feel that I have something to bring to the table. I have a lot of new ideas, innovating ideas. I've played the game of football. I know what the players are thinking. I've been there for 13 years, and that's my approach as far as financing the financing is there it's no problem with that either but that's the reason that i'm doing it is because i feel that i can change some things and make football a lot, a lot better when we return the poignant and ironic words from walter payton why saying goodbye was never easy i think it uh, probably be the hardest thing i i've ever had to do welcome back to our up close primetime retrospective on the life of walter payton i'm roy firestone in 1977, Walter Payton carried the football 40 times for 275 yards, an NFL single-game record. He was a devastating blocker, and his nearly 500 pass receptions was an NFL record for backs when he retired. Once, he even played quarterback for the Bears. He was intense and fiery, but it belied his true personality, a playful kid who never wanted to grow old. Right now, I, uh, I feel like a young kid again. and. Uh... As long as I have these young guys pushing me, I'm, I'm having fun at it. I might be here for a while. Are you still running the hill in front of your house? Still running the hill, doing some other things that almost kill me, but it's still a great time. I think that's the key for you, incredible shape that you keep yourself in. 
keeps the season going. I think that helps, Earl, but I think the key thing is is keeping a young mind or a young perspective. And uh, the way you think is the way you are. And uh, things that I enjoyed doing as a kid, I still enjoy doing. So I think if that's any indication that uh, I've kind of slowed down the times of evolution and I've put it into uh, a neutral stage at this point. When you go into uh, to a season, you, you don't look at the first game that you're involved in. You look at the long haul. That's 16 games. And that means you got to be ready to perform for each game. And the only way that you can be able to perform is that you condition and prepare yourself prior to the season because once the season starts, you start working on the little uh, final points of the game in terms of polishing it so that you, uh, you get, get your timing down, you get the right uh, amount of uh, nourishment, and also you have to work out on the weights. I remember covering you all those years. It was one of, it was one of the things you used to do, you used to do the hill. Yes. Remember that? What, what, where was the hill outside of Chicago, right, right, right near your neighborhood, right? Well, the hill, uh, it started uh, in Mississippi when we were running the, uh, the levees that would keep uh, the Pearl River from flooding, which it didn't do a very good job, but we still use that. Huh. And then I found one in Arlington Heights, which is uh, not too far from my, uh, my home, and it was almost 80 yards in length, and it was at a 45-degree angle. Virtually straight up. Yes. How many times would you run that hill? tell you how uh, difficult it was and how steep it was. The first time that we found the hill and we ran it, we could only do two mm. before we retired. By the time the, uh, the training was, was done and we were ready to go to training camp, we were doing 25. Ooh, incredible. Yes. Where and when, Walter, did you learn the importance of preparation? I mean, was it before you got into football? Well, not really. What, in terms of getting ready, conditioning, and everything else, my second year with the Chicago Bears, it came apparent to me that training and conditioning was the most important thing. Getting yourself prepared physically and mentally so that when you do go into training camp, when they start throwing these complex plays at you and all these different options that you do when, you're, when a defense does something, you can concentrate on that and not have to worry about your physical uh, conditioning. And uh, I developed a training program that was geared around what you do on the football field. In 1987, before Walter Payton quit the game, I talked to him about saying goodbye to the thing he loved most to do in the world, run with the football. Believe me, the thought of leaving before his time really bothered him. How hard do you think it's going to be to say goodbye? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think it uh, probably be the hardest thing I, I've ever had to do, simply because I've done this the longest in my life, and uh, every year, you know, I start training, and it's sort of like a, an obsession that, that I have with, with pain, in other words, and getting myself in the best type of shape that I can be in, and knowing mentally that I'm there, I have arrived there, and for a common goal, to get back into training camp, to get back into the season. But then to say goodbye to that, it uh, it'd probably be hard. I'm probably uh, right now I'm, uh, I'm channeling uh, my efforts in other directions to kind of lessen the uh, the effect or the impact, but it, it's going to be hard, and I probably won't be the same person for a while simply because you, you go through those uh, those stages. You think like Dr. J, there should be a, a farewell Walter tour? For me, I don't I don't think it's necessary, but I think. Uh, for the fans that have uh, that have endured the bad years, the good years, the cold weather, the hot, I think maybe it will be good for them. For uh, because I know how it is. When I receive something, it just makes me feel good. But when I give something, it makes me feel even better. And uh, I, I feel that uh, that type of vibration coming from uh, from the people. When he finally quit in 1987, Walter Payton was the all-time leading rusher in the NFL, all-time ball carrier as well, and at the time, only one touchdown shy of Jim Brown's touchdown record. Yet there was something that gnawed at him. He felt incomplete. He didn't like the way he made his exit. I guess ultimately it ends with the, the portrait of you on the sideline uh, with your, your hands uh, on your face in a very emotional, despondent kind of farewell. Do you feel that in some ways you disappointed yourself in, in, in the way you said goodbye to this crowd? Not at all. You know, I'm, I'm not very good at goodbyes. I, 
I've always either when in parting just wanted it's a look or a, or a touch or a feeling that you give people as as opposed to words because you know you can't find out the right words to really describe what you're feeling but if you but if you generate a, a flow of feeling from you just by a look or a touch then they realize and they feel that unfortunately at that point I couldn't touch everybody in the stands or everyone couldn't get as close to me as possible to see what I was feeling and what I was trying to say in my face what do you think you were feeling disappointment uh, joy anxiety relief fear any uh, no fear I guess it was basically uh, one of the uh, points of not being associated with with it anymore and being uh, on the outside looking in. We'll return with some final thoughts on Walter Payton after this. Welcome back to our Walter Payton retrospective. I'm Roy Firestone. He was a beautiful athlete to watch, graceful and fluid one minute, a pile driving battering ram the next sweetness to his friends, held in shoulder pads for others. When he encountered his greatest challenge as a man, a rare liver disease, he battled it with his trademark toughness. He didn't accept black market organs, and he could have. He kept his dignity, his humor, and his integrity. I had the distinct pleasure of working with Walter Payton in many corporate appearances, and I can tell you firsthand he was much more impressive a man than any captain of industry, any CEO of any multinational company. He took life on in his own way, and he attacked it as he attacked the defenders. That was his legacy. He was grit, heart, joy, and utter passion in everything he did, and in everybody he met. Matt Millen once said that watching Walter Payton on the sideline during a game was a real pleasure. It was an honor, he said, just to tackle them. Well, I felt an honor just to know him. Thanks for watching. I'm Roy Firestone. Good night. Up Close is a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. Proud to be celebrating our 20th anniversary. For more, log on to ESPN.com, part of the Go Network, go.com.